Welcome to ASM Connected, the podcast brought to you from ASM Technologies. In this episode, ASM Technologies Sales Director Ian Tomkinson is joined by the Director of Digital Strategy for Microsoft, Richard Potter. Topics include innovation and how a company as large as Microsoft innovates, how their work behavior has had to change since the pandemic, and how this is going to affect the workplace in years to come. This includes a conversation around how a hybrid workload could transform the way we work in the future. All of that's coming up, along with Richard and Ian's favorite tech gadgets of the moment. This is ASM Connected. Well, welcome to the ASM Connected podcast. And for those who don't know, I'm Ian Tomkinson, the Sales Director for ASM Technologies. And I have as a guest with me, Richard Potter, who is the uh, Director of Digital Strategy for Microsoft and former CTO of French-owned system integrator Soprasteria. I'll uh, start things off, I suppose, a little bit easier with some simple questions. I suppose in terms of you personally, how's the last sort of 15, 16 months been with you with lockdown and how's that affected how you would normally work? Well, extraordinary, I think is probably the, the simplest way of saying it. My work life typically before the pandemic was, it was you know, one very similar, I'm sure, to your own, Ian, where we're on the road most of the week. I'm probably staying in couple of different hotels every week. I spent a significant amount of my time on trains, planes and automobiles. I'm seeing new offices and new venues every single day. And as of March last year, I've been confined to my study. <laughs> Absolutely. Do, do, do you kind of uh, miss that been out and about, I suppose, the people side of it? There are bits of it, definitely, that I, I do miss. But I'm very quick to find all of the compensation that you get from the other bits as well. The privilege of getting up early and, and walking the dog every day and sharing more experiences with the family than you otherwise would do. Being less physically tired, if not mentally tired at the end of the day, all of those are, are upside to the experience. But yeah, I, I, I miss the variety, the contact, the broader stimulation, perhaps, that I used to get by doing more traveling. I completely agree with you. And I, one of the things I've noticed as well is when you're uh, doing uh, Teams meetings, you tend to do them back to back and you're quite sort of uh, privileged if you get a space in between meetings and you've got to be quite disciplined with your diary. However, I think when you were traveling, you would have that time perhaps back on the train or in the car or on the flight home to kind of reflect on, on what happened in the meetings and, and that contact. And I think that's what I miss the most is that little bit of time just to take it all in. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That, that decompression that, that you get in those experiences. And incidentally, you know, things like that fatigue that you get through back to back Teams meetings, that's something that Microsoft identifies and measures and learns and many of the new features that you're seeing being dripped into products like Teams are, are very much there to try and accommodate the different working styles that we're getting. For instance, the together mode that came out quite early on in the pandemic in Teams where you were able to orient virtual meeting rooms on Teams and, and make them look a little more familiar with fake chairs behind them instead of everybody sitting in boxes. That was an endeavor consciously done to try and reduce the fatigue that we get through these virtual experiences. That will continue, I'm sure, as, as these experiences become more and more part of our lives. Uh, certainly uh, been a challenging time and uh, thankfully we're, we seem to be uh, pushing on the way out. So yeah, hopefully uh, I'll start to see a little bit of travel return. Um, I don't think everyone will travel to the extent that they used to, but we'll see how things play out. In terms of, um, I suppose, the wider conversation, innovation, Microsoft is way up there with some of the world's most innovative companies. And uh, we as a um, tech company, we don't actually sell Microsoft, but our customers are huge Microsoft partners. They're heavily into the Microsoft stack. And that's one reason it, it was great to have you on to try and understand uh, what does innovation mean to you in your role? And what's the culture of innovation at, at Microsoft? A lot of this, I think, has been brought into sharper focus through the uncertainty that has characterized the pandemic. And it is that development of strategy through uncertainty that I see as being the primary expression of innovation. What that really means is, is in this world where nobody can say without hubris any real picture on what the world will look like in three weeks time, never mind three months time at the moment, how do organizations 
build the capability to be able to succeed through that uncertainty. And that innovation that enables organizations to come up with new products and services, to reorient their operations and processes, to change that world with agility and, and dynamism through that. We see that as being successfully expressed through three steps. Firstly, successful organizations are, are able to learn well. They're able to understand and make sense of what's happening around them. And from our perspective as a digital organization, that learning is primarily through data and insights. So the ability for you to put telemetry into lots of these experiences, lots of the applications, we just talked about how the use of teams is flagging up work behaviors like fatigue and things like that, putting data and telemetry into those experiences enables us to understand and learn and characterize what that fatigue looks like and when it exists, etc. So the learning bit is really, really important. The second bit is the ability for an organization to then test hypotheses to experiment on those learnings. So having spaces where you can move relatively frictionlessly, relatively safely, and if you're a regulated organization, move into these spaces compliantly, a space that doesn't deflect huge amounts of cost and time from the really important day-to-day -day delivery of the organization, but somewhere where you can experiment and test the hypotheses that are coming out of that learning phase. So your ability to be agile, to work in a, a DevOps experience that is in environments, physical infrastructure environments that are pre-configured, that are easy to stand up and develop. That's a massively important contributor to the, the nature of the innovation that we're seeing. And then the third bit, after the learning and the experimenting, clearly the benefit that organizations are accruing out of this innovation is only really material when, when they can scale it. So being able to successfully move from those experiment environments into big worldwide at scale deployment of the successful experiments and being able to do that confidently and being able to do that in a way that you can demonstrate the at scale benefits, the successful organizations that are innovating through the crisis and beyond are moving through into that scale bit very effectively. So the nice little sort of understanding of thinking about your organization is building the capability to learn, experiment and scale that is the key characteristic of successful innovation at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I suppose when Microsoft is talking about scale, it is on a huge scale. And, uh, you know, I've been extremely impressed with using Teams throughout the last 15 months. Um, I was a diehard, I'm sticking to Skype person pre-pandemic. I will admit that, <laughs> like, like I, I think a number of, uh, of people out there. And uh, we, we obviously went down the Teams route because um, thankfully our IT guys had already deployed that and, and we were trying to migrate away from Skype. And uh, But the pace that new features and, and new tools that a couple of, that you touched on earlier that Microsoft pushed out that learning testing and scaling the pace that a, a, an organization the size of Microsoft moved is unbelievable and uh, credit to it yeah I mean and I can remember the the breathless days of 15 16 17 months ago when we were having to configure and, and uh, you know, make available vast scales of amounts of infrastructure, doing global deployments of teams for big global organizations of tens of thousands of people worldwide in 24 hours. And that speed was unprecedented, is unlikely to take place again. But I mean, that's the power of the cloud as a demonstration of the ability for that whole mobilization to take place with confidence and to not lose people along the way. That's where we are as a world, as a society, with the benefit of this kind of technology and capability. I absolutely agreed. And uh, moving uh, to how that all impacts, what, you know, what does all this mean in, in reality? And there's a lot of talk about hybrid working how tools going to help with customer engagement in the future, product and, and service innovation. What does that mean to, to, to you in reality? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different angles to come at that. But if we push 
on from the, the sort of the teams based hybrid working experience. Let's develop that a little bit more. I mean, we, we would probably experience teams initially as being just a way of keeping the communication going that we used to do physically. We can now do virtually through cameras and screens with great sophistication and confidence. But very, very quickly, you realize that actually that environment becomes an enabler of greater digitization and greater productivity. So it becomes an environment within which you're drawing on bits of infrastructure security, for instance. So the identity that you're bringing into these experiences is managed through the Office 365 identity that is sitting underneath Teams. So you've, you've got a confidence of identity and security that is moving you into a secure platform for conversations. But then it's also a single digital space within which people can share data, can share digital experiences, can collaborate on documents, can bring to life PowerPoints with interactivity and use workloads like artificial intelligence to put natural language processing into, to caption, to translate, to synchronize to all of, all of those productivity experiences. And then beyond that, you're beginning to realize the power of these platforms to digitize much of your workflow, the integration of applications into Teams. So from Microsoft's perspective, using things like Power Apps and Power Automate and embedding those functionalities within your hybrid working platform, your Teams platform, to enable you to take advantage of the fact that you are now all collaborating together in this digital space and you're then able to use that digitization to extend it into the greater digitization of your operations. And then the big question then is, is that why does that then just need to be a remote story? These benefits of using these digital experiences are things that you can carry with you and you can carry back into the office. So just because you're back into a physical environment, getting all of that benefit that we talked about earlier of the, the stimulation and the human contact, you don't have to lose the benefits of the digital experience that's making your remote working experience so productive as well. And so the vision for hybrid working is, is how you're able to bring much of this digital collaborative experience into a physical workplace where you're able to infuse and augment that physical meeting, that physical encounter that you've got in your office with those great digitized experiences that you're relying on when you're remote. That's where inevitably we will go and the scale at which each organization and each section of society is physically in the office or remote working will vary and, and, and it will vary within those organizations according to the different demographics that sit in that space. We'll be using all of that digital experience alongside our physical experience to create this virtuous hybrid world that will transform productivity and the way that we work in the future. I like the term uh, single digital space. That really does resonate because uh, I do think that, um, you know, the fact that when you're on a Teams meeting uh, that you can pop stuff in the, into the chart, review documents and do that. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that sums it up for me, which is, uh, which is quite good. But in, in terms of that innovation and that hybrid working, one of the things that we do work with is a lot of, uh, I suppose, complementary products to Microsoft. We've seen it over the years where you've got a market leader and people develop various plugins to enhance performance. Quite often we see the term agility used to describe access to those uh, products, those are different benefits. I suppose what I'm quite kind of interested in is how do large organizations, FTSE 100 companies, Microsoft, how, when you get to a certain scale, how does a business stay agile and how do you keep innovating at pace? Really important question and, you know, one that should be at the heart of all leadership strategy as we come out of the pandemic and beyond. And clearly, from a technology point of view, there are huge capabilities that sit within the way that particularly Microsoft's platform is configured that give it that ability to be agile from things like the non-functional aspects of security and reliability and identity, all of those basic infrastructure ingredients that enable you to do things with confidence on a platform are key enablers of, of that agility. 
But the fundamental driver of that persistent agility is always going to be culture. It, it is always going to be the ability to which your people feel empowered to run through that process of learning, experimenting and scaling. That ability for them to want to learn, to be curious, to feel able to be curious in those learning moments. The humility, but also the confidence that comes at the heart of what we would call in Microsoft a growth mindset, where you are comfortable with the fact that you don't know it all and there is always something more that you can learn is one of the biggest motors that sits inside that space. From a, a Microsoft point of view, that focus on our culture and our values, that value of growth mindset and, and the you know recognition that we are here to help every person and every organization on the planet achieve more, that is a relentless focus for us. It's something that we never give up on and we, we will never give up on as we seek to develop and grow as a company. Every organization has got their own interpretation of that, is building their own engine of agility and innovation based on their own values. And, and they need to keep focusing on that as we continue to discover what this new world beyond the pandemic looks like. A couple of things that you, you've touched on a number of times. One is learning. And uh, I do think this industry is absolutely amazing because uh, it's a, an industry where you can never stop learning. And quite often when I'm uh, speaking to people and interviewing and people ask that question, you know, what keeps you doing the job that you're doing? That's always my response is, you know, you're always constantly learning. And, you know, 30 years been in the industry, I'm still learning pretty much every day. And, and that, that's amazing gift this industry keeps giving, which is, uh, which is quite good. In terms of, um, you know, the future, you mentioned before that, you know, it's difficult to plan sort of three weeks ahead, never mind three months or, or three years. And I think people have probably shifted their three-year plans and brought them down to probably six or 12 months. How optimistic about the future are you? Or, or is there some concerns there? I am an optimist, naturally. So I will I will always run towards the opportunity that sits in this space rather than rather than run away from it. But the reason for that optimism is because I can shift from the optimism that one would want to get from imagining what the future looks like to being comfortable with the fact that we are building the ingredients for whatever that future looks like. That shift of being less concerned about being able to describe what the world looks like in three years time to being able to characterize what are the key ingredients that will make us successful whatever that world looks like in three years time that's the thing that i think is it gives me the confidence if you've just perfectly articulated this industry that we're in is an industry that is always reinventing, is always learning, is always building that capability and has a track record of, of solving problems because of its engineering DNA that gives me that great confidence that whatever the world looks like in, in three years' time, we will have the skills and the capabilities to be able to transform this world that we live within for, in a positive way. Some people say that I'm a pessimist, but actually I'm, a, uh, I'm an optimist with experience is the way I like to describe it, um, because quite often, you know, you, you can kind of look at history and, and learn from that. But again, it comes down to, uh, as you've mentioned several times, you know, learning, testing things out and scaling, which is, uh, which is a great message from this so far. On to something a little bit more sort of uh, e easygoing, um, just to sort of round things off. Everybody has a, uh, a favorite gadget. What's your favorite tech gadget? Oh, impossible to pin it down to one. I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a techie. I'm an engineer by background. I'm relentlessly fiddling and trying new things. And so my, my house is littered with smart devices, some, some failed and redundant smart devices, some, some more important. I suppose if I was going to pick the unifying thing, it's, it's actually trying to knit some of them together and using things like Power Automate and, and various applications on top of these gadgets to try and, as, as my wife will probably testify with horror, to try various experiments around the house. And, uh, <laughs> 
completely and utterly unnecessarily many of our experiences that worked perfectly well before <laughs> brilliant yeah i like that yeah no I, i'm often in for trouble for tinkering with things as well but uh but yeah i, I think um i think I, I would opt easily for the uh, smartphone i think it's something that we would all really uh have an impact on as if we didn't have it these days we're so used to it lastly something that i, I ask majority of our guests is for the top four finishes for the Premier League up and coming season. What are your thoughts on that? Oh gosh, I mean, I'm a Liverpool fan by background, so I mean, Liverpool's always going to feature on that list, and and I'd hope that in terms of the the men's team and also the women's team, that they're top of their league, whatever. But I think if I was going to sort of think about other contenders in those in those top four predictions. I mean, the other side of me is the fact that I am a techie and I would love Brentford to get up there. Wouldn't that be a terrific thing? The whole money ball and data analytics story that sits behind Matthew Benham and Brentford and, and all of that. I mean, that would just be, that would be terrific to sort of, to see how data and tech was actually transforming a sport that needs innovation, that needs to needs to think about how it positions itself in the future. And I think the Brentford story is absolutely phenomenal and really exciting for the future. Great. No, no, that's uh, a great thought. And uh, I suppose in terms of everybody likes an underdog, everybody was, even the, uh, the non-Leicester fans a few seasons ago were quite pleased that Leicester had actually... Uh, proved that um, it wasn't necessarily down to uh, paying out big bucks. That's me having a little bit of a dig of our rivals across the other side of the city on the blue side, but that, but there we go. That's me being biased. But uh, but no, it's been great speaking to you today, Richard. Uh, really insightful, and I think some great messaging there for our audience. And um, again, thank you for taking the time out to speak to us. Great to speak to you. Brilliant. My pleasure, and Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of ASM Connected, the podcast from ASM Technologies with guest Richard Potter from Microsoft. If you enjoyed this episode and want to find out more about ASM Technologies or about anything discussed in this episode, visit asmtech.com. And if you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe now and never miss an update. This is ASM Connected.